much for the invitation. Um, I know my, my lecture is uh, maybe less uh, perfect, it's more a kind of collection of examples, but I hope we can also take something out of it. Is it blurry? No, it's normal. Um, I start with a project we did in 2008 where we were asked to do a show in at the Venice Biennale in the German Pavilion and it was called Updating Germany. And of course it was in the big kind of um, bubble of um, sustainable um, concepts and, and thinking of climate change and future and peak oil and things. And I think at that moment we had already the idea, maybe it's over already talking about that, but it was still on and it's still going on. But it's, what is interesting that, that at that point there were two streams coming together that for a long time there were futurists of the, on the technology side thinking about new windows and new insulation and high tech, whatever. And there were on the other side were ecologists thinking about um, biodiversity and um, reducing life, thinking small and um, also having maybe a different lifestyle. And that was extremes that kind of, I think it's in everywhere in the world, but especially I think in Europe coming together, that that's necessary. And these kind of like critiques in a way of, uh, of, of the past and thinking of a better future was our idea that could be find project for the better projects for the better future. And um, one thing that is maybe related to the failed arc, failed um, utopia idea is, or the, the beyond failure idea is that we thought that all this needs updates. And updates means that there is a is a challenge, but we don't believe in revolution at that moment. But there might be drastic changes and updating, you know, from computers could on the one hand mean that there's only a small change to the surface, to the um, usability, and it's just a new color or new symbol. But on the other hand, sometimes it's also on a computer, maybe the change from a 16-bit to 32-bit system or something drastic or it's totally reprogrammed, a total different approach onto using it. And if you do that, what happens is Unfortunately, you also, especially if the change is big, you bring in new problems. So in computers it's bugs and then you get like smaller updates and it's an ongoing process and then maybe it's also for marketing reasons that there's a new function so that people have to buy it again. And it's a continuous process and we thought that might also be the case in architectural terms. And maybe that's also something that we can take beyond failure because it's always the next steps that might be one back and then two forward again, that have to that has to be inclusive in architecture. And so we thought of projects and started with architecture and thought about foam follows green and I brought this uh, bunker, it's a shelter, concrete shelter built in Hamburg during the Second World War and it's still standing. So we thought maybe that's very, of course it failed and it's still standing, so maybe it's very sustainable because it's still there. And also, it's part of the IBA Hamburg now, and they turned it into an energy bunker by using it to store energy inside of this massive concrete walls. And also, there is a museum on sustainability inside, and whatever, some other tricks, like you see on the picture, the idea of having solar panels. But it's interesting that often, former buildings like this one here, it's a printing factory, are turned into cultural centers, and at that point, the bunker was turned into uh, an ecological center. So maybe that's also a new form of updating possible for buildings. And then I very quickly go, by the way, to this big book that we made. So it's called Updating uh, Germany and it was projects for a better future. And we thought, okay, what will the environment of tomorrow look like? The post fossil landscapes. And I brought one example here. This is a... Um, um, open mining fields for coal between Aachen and Köln and um, they had already excavated a lot of coal but there was is more in the ground and it's very deep and they are very used to then remove the villages somewhere else, build a new village and take down everything and make a very deep hole and in that case the, diff the height difference between the where the coal is and the upper level is actually 400 meters, and that's a crazy amount of um, 
earth moved. And if you're a landscape architect, it would be fantastic to do that because this kind of terraforming is normally it's impossible to pay for it. It's very expensive. And it's a huge field and you could remove 400 meters. And in that case, the office of Brandenhuber and Bureau for Constructivismus, two teams, thought maybe we could, di could do it differently and ask the engineering companies and the, the excavating companies, mining companies to work together with them and not remove the village that was supposed to be removed, but move the bugger kind of, the not, not bugger, uh, the, um, well, the machine that excavates the stuff around it and form a landscape with the idea that, okay, the village has to bear a lot of noise and dirt for a long time, but in the end, we will form this nice marina around the building and then uh, around the village and uh, then water will come into the, the lake and it takes normally 50 years, but if we use a river, it's only 30 years. So in 100 years, in the first 50 years of excavation and then you need to rebuild it and then uh, maybe 30 years for the water, this village might be at the sea and at the lake. And they actually convinced the mayor to buy the website Elsdorf up on lake. And dream of that uh, long-term future and that's uh, so that's also maybe beyond failure beyond something that is totally not what they want they have this far ahead dream of um, thinking of so that's the dream that's the the village is there or well that is the village and then there's this idea of having the the lake and of course that relates also to the question how do we want to live? What kind of technology what do we want to use? And this is about an example by Holwig Kushner architects from New York. And they thought, okay, if we have this very advanced technology, what could be the next step? And they think maybe it's biological more than technical innovation that makes the next shift. And we could maybe also learn from plants and genetically modify them. And plants use photosynthesis anyway to generate idea that transport water and this power plant, like it's a word, word of game, um, could grow over the city and bring all the media you need. You can climb along the trees, and that would be also the streets. And that, that could be a future for a city. Or it could be new intelligent structures. Maybe you've seen that, like uh, boats that are dragged by huge kites and it's also an update because it's a very old technology. Sailing brought through a sport like kite surfing to container ships. So it's also a loop of um, things that are outdated and then brought on a side track back to um, big business. But in the end, I think it's important that the people we are part of these processes and. Um, the responsible consumption is very important. So what can we do? And we found this family, the Bucher family, in a small town in Germany, in Lorsch. And they became the world championship, world champions, well maybe not world champions, but they became the champions in energy saving made by a TV station in Germany. And they're super proud that they saved 99% of their CO2 footprint without architects actually. That's why it's kind of, Maybe architects don't like the design of this house, how it looks now. And of course, it was a little provocation to show it at the Biennale. But these people are super proud and um, they actually left their jobs to become energy um, consultants and now help other people to do that. And maybe it's also a question to the architects, why couldn't they help these people? Or where is the gap between well, the profession and the user? So real change begins at home. And now what? So in this book there are actually, actually 100 examples under the title Better Future. And at that point we thought, okay, but who, know, who can say what is a better future? Isn't that very subjective? And probably what we think is the better future, the next generation might think it wasn't such a good idea. And that would be also the, the failure. And we had a lot of um, doubts about it, uh, Zweifel. And so from this big catalog, we made a smaller book. It's called, it's unfortunately only in German, it's called Better Future on the looking for the spaces of tomorrow. And we asked um, 
a lot of people, expert philosophers, architects, politicians, how they think that the world actually looks like in 100 years. And of course, this is a very um, difficult question, and serious scientists would normally say, well, I don't know, I, won't better, I would better not answer to this, but surprisingly many people did, and they told us interesting stories about their better future, and we had illustrators working on it. It was sometimes very dystopian, but some had also very interesting machines that came up, and so, well, we, but we couldn't hardly find a straight line, even though there's tons of great ideas, and I recommend to read it, but it wasn't really giving us a straight line what future was happening, and we're becoming also more and more humble how to deal with the future, and we made a little book um, <laughs> called Talking Futures, and it's, well, some people, actually I didn't have this thing, but some people told me it looks like a Mao Bible. No, we thought more of, um, like if you go to Spain and you have this little uh, book to read some funny sentences, I like to, how to order an ice cream or something. And, and in the book there is a text on, on futures of utopias, talking about the, the relation of the both and um, and we think that utopian idea is still important to um, to also have a long-term kind of thinking, but the, and, and and develop ideas and hopes and um, yes. But the real problem of this is the straight line to utopia. As soon as somebody uh, tries to actually achieve the future, it is probably bound to fail and has also brought a lot of um, bad experience, I guess, to humanity and. Um, so we have to, on the one hand, we, we think it's important to develop utopian ideas, and but maybe you should be careful by straightly uh, trying to achieve it. And then there is in the book a lot of sentences like, in, in English and in German, not totally literally translated, um, that might be helpful in any future. <laughs> and actually on the photos on the side are taken from a trip to Bangladesh, that we did a similar process and realized if you do a workshop on the future in Dhaka, it's funny that people there, well, we do this scenario-based workshops and we have a lot of coordinates of what are the factors for the future and if you, if you go to Dhaka, they have almost all the problems you can imagine. They are totally overcrowded, still a very poor country, but very much developing at the moment. There's a lot of um, dirt in the air because they produce all these um, um, slabs, bricks and they came in a very classical way and it's bound to be flooded from the rain and from the sea and well, it's a difficult place but the people we work with we had like all these weird conditions and then their fantasies turned out to be all fantastic so you, Dhaka is going to be a very great place so maybe what Daryl was talking about the, the kind of um, utopian visions that the London-based uh, architecture students have, I, I think that's also sometimes similar in Germany, it's maybe also because we, we're already at a good place, so we only can imagine can get worse, but in, in Dhaka it's quite different and they have amazing ideas. Okay, and um, do you know probably this example, Marshall McLuhan, um, I read the, the quote, we look at the present through a rear view mirror, we march backwards into the future. And uh, th that's quite crucial. I also work for um, car industry somewhat, not me, my, some of my partners in the office work for the car industry. And they are very afraid of the future and ask now a lot of urbanists and architects, how will it be, can we still sell cars and um, what will happen? And um, to explain something to them is very helpful to use also analogies and images, including cars. And um, there's, the story is following, and that's related to this image. Imagine you're driving in a car and somebody tapes the front view totally with black tape. Then, and you have rear view mirrors, or side mirrors and rear view mirrors. You can quite safely drive on because you see the street um, passing behind you, and yeah, perfect. <laughs> Only what is not so cool if the, uh, the street makes a curve, or there's something on the street, like a person, or another car, or something in the way, then it doesn't work at all. And um, that's actually still 
the way how most decisions are made, that they look into the past and say, okay, it worked, it will still work, and especially in architecture as a kind of, well, not in, maybe not architecture, but in the real estate business, it's a very usual thing that you do what was sold before will also sell, so you do the same, and okay, it actually doesn't work very often, and that's why it's so risky, because if it doesn't work, you're totally surprised, and that's why I think it's often interesting to look at failures to be aware of the possibility that it might fail and um, stay flexible and also think about what is very fashionable term of resilience and uh, robustness that there are, there are always other options and they should be also thought through and I brought this, well the first quote is in German but I think you can read it, it's Walter Ulbricht in 1961 saying nobody has the, the plan to erect a wall and very shortly afterwards they did so all these kind of and of course it also failed and Leonard Cohen is looking back at that time and he's very worried about the future for Berlin we um, unlike um, Dakar the, we made scenarios for Berlin and here people also well, it turned out to be quite dystopian and we had the same illustrator as for the book uh, we asked her also again to read through the text and um, develop Berlin and here's an image of fundamentalities and as a city where all these different neighborhoods are totally segregated and have their special issues so one is a, it's about religion or it's about um, brand, so one, there's for example one place that only has apple um, producers and it's mostly connected to Cupertino and not to their neighbors and some area has a mountain inside so that's then connected to the Alps and the Rocky Mountains and, and, and so that means that maybe they're specialized uh, separate entities. Or another city could develop into what we call the Think Tankstelle Berlin so the idea that Berlin stays this kind of creative hub and you buy drink, milk, coffee and you get kind of financed by your parents and, um, and create fancy ideas. But in that moment it was happening that it's not Europe anymore where the money is made but it's maybe in China. But they keep Berlin alive because it's like a sweatshop for ideas happening in, in Berlin. Maybe it's already like this. And then totally dystopian, like a Blade Runner Berlin vision, or a better working Berlin Incorporated, where the diversity also in architecture led to a quite free and but still like consumerist-based um, Berlin. These illustrations in the text are we made for Arch Plus this magazine. So if you want to read, there's also stories, of course, to all of these um, drawings. There. And now I come to something, I, one of my roles that I didn't hear you told about is the DATS. And this is the invitation of the failed architecture to um, the DATS. And they made a very nice workshop on Cottbus or Tor. I don't know if you know it, but uh, it's a modernist um, building in Berlin. And it was at the site where there was a former 19th century area to live in and they turned it they bought it like they rebuilt it in the 70s and from the day one it was a difficult area and there were a lot of social restructuring programs and uh, they had a lot of problems and it looks like this now and it was often discussed uh, so you see also from the satellite dishes that are super low angled you can in a way tell from which region the mostly migrant people that live there come from because they kind of angle it to different satellites, it's quite interesting um, way of determining who's living where. <laughs> and I live about 100 meters from this building and it's actually, it, it's a it was always kind of a nice area but a little bit rough. But now it's turning into a tourist center also, the whole area. And so it was funny, while in the public opinion the Cottbus Tour is actually kind of a failed building and it's maybe linked to this very famous example of Pruitt Igor to have, and I have funnily the exactly same picture I think that uh, Daryl found on the internet and um, <laughs> um, 
And so that was what the Cottbus Hotel, many people asked to happen to it, that should be taken down. But then, um, failed architecture, question mark, came to Berlin and saved it. No, not really, they didn't save it, but finally happened, it was already saved, and when they came and interviewed people, I had the feeling that some of the people living there were totally afraid that by talking about it also in architecture center, we would actually push gentrification for that area. So the new failure was that people living there now were afraid that it became now so trendy that they couldn't afford to stay there anymore. So the, the failure is really um, can kind of happen on both ends and the switch happened within maybe five years and, uh, and still people are, some people are still on the old track and some are on the new and it was, I think, quite a good example for uh, your workshop because it, it was really open and what kind of failure was talked about. And I think it was a great workshop and they even managed to bring the, the, the architect of that building in the 70s to the table and talk to us and he was still kind of sad about how he thinks his plans were never really realized and it only failed because they didn't build the interior and the kindergarten or some social functions and but that of course by time and by updates was three times already um, overthrown in a way and I think now it actually doesn't work too bad. And last thing is that this table you see it is a table by a group called the Anxious Prop and here you see this table is the form of a Y so a question mark and we use this table very often to um, do a trialogue and to find new ways out of often too simple answers and maybe that's also an important question for tonight that uh, being ready and open to ask questions is still most important and in Linz I got asked to um, teach sustainable architecture and when I first thought okay that's not for me because I I hardly have built a house, so I, I cannot tell a um, student how to make a super energy efficient house or something. And then I give, and, and, I, and then, but I said, yeah, please come, but please come. And then I gave a lecture and told them, okay, if I do sustainable architecture education, then it might be about that there are young students that then have to work as architects for the next 30 or 40 years. And in their life, they have to build buildings that hopefully make sense for 30, 40, 50 years. So in a way we talk about the time horizon of 100 years and of course we don't know what this future will look like but what we know is that people have to be open enough to always have the right, like maybe not the right, but new questions and think about already existing things in a new way and have open minds and I think that's something we can teach. Thank you. Thank you.